Namaste, welcome to the next session of Chatinar. A warm welcome to our attendees, definitely, and definitely to our speakers as well. Today's session is sponsored by Sridhar and Network Gain, Exxon, Adray, MV Technologies, and Madras Mindworks. And as we start today, our conversation on automation in the CIO CTO's world, perhaps we are, today we are going to take about slightly different nuance. We're not going to talk about the usual RPA, IPA, the process focus, the process oriented type of automation, but we are going to look at what happens behind the scene. So we're going to talk about what in a CIO's world, in a CTO's world, what happens for infrastructure, what happens in your data ops, how does your enterprise architecture get involved here? That's what our conversation is. I'll go on and, and introduce our guest speakers today. Ajay Mehar is a group CIO of Ampersand Group. Ampersand Group is a large conglomerate of different kind of companies with education. Their most famous brand is Vipri or Vipri or Schools. Thanks, Ajay. Thank you very much, Swas, and hi, everybody. Srivas Kotamasu, he is ex tree recently, but he was the global delivery lead for infrastructure managed services. So, appropriate individual to talk about infrastructure automation as involved in services. Third, Gaurav. Gaurav and I have interacted together in at different clients in the past. He comes from Amazon Internet Services, so which means that he's an AWS guy. He is a principal uh, solutions architect. He's fairly well known in the community. We have interacted earlier around data, data ops kind of stuff. So that's what I would love to hear from him and surely you as well. And finally, Srikant, Srikant Karuri, he's been a client and a colleague. He's with IQVR. Srikant is a CIO and business partner for mainly for South Asia. He again is infrastructure, but also is the, C the other CTO part which means a lot of technology gets developed there in as well. So you would notice that all our guests today, they come from different type of areas very deliberately so that they cover services as given to clients. They also are infrastructure people. They are people who provide a platform. And in case of Ajay, they are the usual place where services would be provided. My name is Suhas Datta. I represent Trinayan. We are a strategy consulting company. Let's start right. off maybe in the same uh, sequence, maybe with Ajay and then I wanted to have a quick chat about your automation journey. Again, we're not talking about RPA, IPA, but stuff which is not so glamorous, a little behind the scenes. Ajay, in your case, especially because you are catering to education, which means children at one end or whatever other type of students at one end. How does it really work? How has it been different during this COVID time as well? Sure. Thanks, Swaz, and good evening, everybody. So you rightly put the COVID time, and I joined these organizations around one and a half years back. And after I joined, the pandemic has talked to almost everybody globally. And all the IT strategy for every organization taken something disruptively changed. And when I'm talking about disruptively changed, more or less, we all moved to work from home. So all of a sudden, the typical DR disaster recovery, et cetera, et cetera, got kicked in. Coming back to very short over there that we had a challenge how to automate the classrooms. We have 50,000 plus students all over India. And we had a challenge how to automate all the classrooms uh, to a virtual classes and which we have to be done in more than 15 days or little more than 15 days and that's where the infrastructure centric changes comes into the picture so we immediately did a lot of activities over there where 50,000 students are enabled with respect to uh, having their classes online classes from wherever they are and not only the classes we have to create the learning management systems enabled completely for all the students so that put quite a big challenges in front of us because we never thought that that's the way forward for 
any educational institute and uh, when we looked into it it can't be done something like on a brick standard brick and mortar way we have to do a lot of automations over there automations of student enrollment automations of class settings how to create a class how to schedule a class etc which comes into the picture so behind the stage we have to do many things over there probably we can talk more about it but that's one of the critical things which has come to our life immediately once the pandemic has talked to all of us. Thanks, Ajay. Thank you. And wondering, maybe we could, Srinivas, we could uh, go with you. Sure. Similarly, perhaps it, it attaches with what would it be like to provide infrastructure or other kind of behind the scenes automation as services to a client? What did you see happen with those clients? Sure. My focus, as you rightly put, has been from the infrastructure perspective. Many of the customers that we started working with uh, 14, 15 years ago mostly have been the traditional physical infrastructure and at best maybe on a VMware kind of uh, virtualized environment, not even in a private cloud. So later we have seen customers moving into private cloud uh, based on um, uh, VMware or the, some of the other open technologies that were there. and subsequently moving into the cloud infrastructure. And then along the way, some of them picked up the agile methodology and DevOps way of uh, developing their applications and things like that. So mostly my experience with uh, you know infrastructure automation has been as a service provider, as I was part of the MindTree organization. So at times, we are enabled by the maturity of the customer in their uh, approach and uh, investment into infrastructure automation. And at times we were uh, constrained by the immaturity of a customer in terms of uh, their approach to infrastructure automation. So I have seen a spectrum of customers uh, right from just task level automation and uh, simple steps being automated in the entire process all the way to you know, people who have completely adopted uh, DevOps as a methodology and uh, a strong, fully end to end, fully automated CI CD pipeline, uh, including the infrastructure provisioning, the environment being templatized, you know, uh, tools like uh, Terraform and the cloud formation, all these kind of things used for making sure that their uh, infrastructure for every stage of the engineering cycle has been standardized and repeatable. And internally within MyTree, um, the cloud uh, uh, infrastructure automation has been mostly towards the services that we were providing. One is to automate the tasks that we were uh, performing to make sure that you know the quality of the service is improved. The effort we were spending, the manual effort that is removed, and on the other hand, making sure that our tools and uh, frameworks were able to detect if something goes wrong or something needs to be taken in, in terms of action, that is uh, detected uh, as early as possible and if possible, automate the action as well, remedial action. So this is how my uh, infrastructure automation journey has been. So I have seen a wide spectrum of experiences because mainly I was working with my customers and most of the times their uh, journey kind of influences how we approach that particular engagement as well. Thanks, Anivas. That, that gives me a thread to pick this up with actually Srikant. Srikant, so I'll consider two different situations, what is today, and maybe from the time that you and I have worked together, you would remember that particular year we had multiple bugs happening in Bangalore. So BCP DR type of situations, though they were not as long as, as this one. What do you think in terms of your CIO office, in terms of automation, were the differences between about that time versus now, what has changed, what has changed for the positive. And I find this very interesting in a way because IQVIA, for uh, those of you who are, might not be aware, besides other things that uh, the company runs clinical trials of different kinds of drugs. I think from standpoint, I think you, you made it very well. It's pre COVID and post COVID yeah, because things that were undiscussable pre COVID times where you, know, you just reinforce your core. And uh, you assume that everybody comes to office, starts working, everything is fine. Whether it's on-prem, off-prem, everything is fine. Everybody's happy. But the minute COVID set in, I think the whole uh, rules of the game have changed. You can have the best of the core uh, in your office, but uh, 
as long as people are not having the touch and feel of being in office, you know, you can't run into kind of, um, provisioning. In other words, whether it's code provisioning, infrastructure provisioning. So that's when I think there wasn't uh, much effort to actually dust off all the continuity and recovery plans. There was a lot of focus on reinforcing the code, which happened um, in the initial uh, few uh, weeks of time because we had to scale up some things. But subsequent, one of the big uh, challenges that we addressed in a typical three to four week time frame is we were um, amplifying the edge compute in other ways. In other words, you know, we were trying to help people work on off prem container, Docker environments, and we have set up that in a very rapid manner. And we are already a hybrid cloud company in all sense. <clears throat> so we had to do that for like two to three weeks. And uh, specifically talking about automation, um, and three weeks from, from the start of COVID, I think we came back to a steady state. That's a, that's a big change uh, to us subsequent to what uh, we have had a few years ago to now. We have come to a steady state. Subsequently, the other challenge was it's more about automation in the true sense. In other words, you know, pre-2013 IEEE definition was different from post-2017 definition of automation where we talk about intelligent automation where, you know, it is actually applicable, impactful, and then it's making some sense to the business. So that's where I think COVID actually gave us a very good use case on having the rubber on the road. In other words, all your automation theories that you put together, all your resiliency theories that you put together, to your point, the continuity and recovery plan that you put together, if you're actually wanting to walk the talk with customers, COVID has actually given a very good template. And I think every enterprise that I talked about or I, I conversed with has come out of that period with a very good storyline to say, you know what, whatever were undiscussable prior to COVID, is all now at least got to the table. You know, people are able to converse openly and they're spelling it out that we have had this issue, we have addressed this challenge. So uh, for us, it's more of an intelligent automation, yeah, at least mm -hmm. in the post COVID days, and we've started to work on that. Excellent. Thanks, Rakan. Part of this was reliving memories uh, of, of uh, yesterday years. Let me uh, take the same roundtable conversation to Gaurav, but uh, let me add something in terms of infrastructure. Let me have you, Gaurav, talk a little bit about infrastructure automation as well. How have you seen it help in today's world? And I'm asking especially because you, you are a platform provider. So if, if you would talk about infrastructure as code, how would it help in a situation like this? Absolutely. Um, what we've seen and uh, being in the position that I am in, uh, leading the architecture team with startups, I've been a witness to the journey for a large number of startups. Startups anyways are cash trapped and these times were even more difficult for them. So what stayed in the realm of theory or where fancy stories that were implemented by our customers like Airbnb and Netflix came down to them as reality, where they had to respond to the stimulus and the stimulus being the whole pandemic episode that happened and they had to automate everything. Now, our customers are traditionally uh, created by developers because infrastructure is anyways provided by AWS. So what came into play is that they know how to version control their code and automate the entire cycle of deploying their code. Going forward, they had to realize that even infrastructure is a part of code because the entire thing is virtualized for them. And their whole DevOps cycle, or uh, as we'll speak later, the DevSecOps cycle was completely automated. So as you deploy your code, your immutable architecture, your, your tool sets that are available today from AWS like CloudFormation or CDK or the open source one like Terraform, Chef, Puppet, all of those come into play. We get hand in hand and create your architectures which are uh, resilient, secure, operational and respond to the spiky nature of the workloads that, that the work has been in, in the recent times. You do not know or you cannot assume the, that it follows the patterns that it followed prior to the COVID time. And that's where I see a lot of startups pivoting themselves and auto scaling and using infrastructure as code. Beyond that, in fact, they don't necessarily want to use infrastructure. So as, as uh, Srikant said, right, it's not just infrastructure. They think beyond the, the CPUs and RAM. They also think about containerizing the uh, operation so that it is easily portable. 
In fact, a bulk of the customers that we talk to today also talk about serverless and hence no infrastructure that they need to manage for time. So that's been my experience uh, looking at a large number of startups and even enterprises uh, in, in the past one year. Thank you for leaving a thread there for me, which I'll pick up now. Maybe we talk a little bit about adoption. Srinivas, maybe we could start with you perhaps and have a have then uh, Srikant talk about this a little bit as well. What kind of adoption have you actually seen among, among your large base of clients? What, what has been the openness? Not necessarily in the completely developed type of countries or economies, but in other places as well. What, what have you seen? I could perhaps give an example. So legal services, CRO, there has always been kind of a struggle with the SMEs versus technology. Over there, how far are we going to go and automate? So now if you were to try and automate the behind the scenes type of work on which the rest of the company is resting on, how does it really work? So Shrinivas, if you could take a crack from your client base, and if you could take, uh, just provide your experience. Yes. Question perhaps also is how much adoption do you see between SMEs or acceptance from SMEs and, and business guys, especially yes. because infrastructure forms the bulwark of what the business runs on. Sure. See, uh, if I can, you know, divide my customer base into um, you know, the support that we're providing for uh, engineering teams, where uh, they have a large uh, application base, whether it is modern or the legacy applications that they are developing or maintaining. That's one side. The other section is the production um, environment that we were supporting, where uh, uh, you know. Uh, provisioning the new cap new capacity that is required to take care of the load. And on the other extreme are uh, the digital organizations where they were mostly the marketing organizations within the enterprises, uh, you know, where uh, the, they, they are not burdened with the technology debt or the legacy of the applications that they were dealing with. So they were mostly very, very thin on the application layer, but very, very they need to be nimble on the implementation side. Those are the kind of customers where uh, we have seen most of the this adoption of um, infrastructure as code and uh, been the fastest. So, so, okay. so as from my standpoint, I think um, the whole ecosystem has now become more flexible. So to answer your question very specifically, whatever was undiscussable pre-COVID, it's all being discussed now. Now, the two, three examples I want to give you. If you look at the overall at least from a uh, CRO standpoint, you know, the amount of adoption of EDC platforms, uh, we talk about Rave or Inform or any cloud-based platform, uh, if you look at industry trends also, it is like there's a massive surge, which means that there could be a, there could have been a possibility, but never explored for different reasons, you know, and one of the, perhaps one of the myth cut perhaps could be that, hey, you know what, um, there is a concern if you put it on cloud or things like that. Uh, not not in the true sense, but there could be some concern, some reservation. But now that's all changed. Even we, at least I have been speaking to some of the healthcare fraternity and I found that especially the guys in this part of the world where who kind of work with local um, or, or regional uh, companies, uh, they have all come out in the open adapting the new platform, whether it is platform or service, infrastructure surveys or for that matter coding as a service you know they, because because obviously dependence is so high and timelines have shrunk you know pre covid the timelines were very different post covid it's all like you know you need to get it realized and into production quickly so this whole ci cd pipeline and all of that also has been redefined to be honest and i've seen people talking about simulators to just test some code on the fly on the fly looking for some cloud management tool you know where they can just manage because you are in a cloud where you have a b c d commercial vendors and you know you are in a situation where uh, nobody is coming to office or you know we don't have so many resources to work on that kind of multi cloud uh, platform so you you need people who can really manage all of this orchestrate this right and on at speed so that's when i think most of the customers have opened up and and if you look at um, the EDC surge, it's phenomenal. I think it's like close to 20, 25% in the last two quarters, the amount of adoption that has happened. So it's changing 
it is going to change it's bound to change and i would think that come 2021 end of 2021 because this is the phase where slowly things are coming back to normalcy but it's never going to be the normal that we assumed about it's all going to be out in the wild you know hybrid collaboration hybrid uh, uh, compute hybrid uh, cloud platforms being developed uh, more of gitlab more of githubs you know those kind of things. it's all about crowd sourcing things rather than think i will do this and if i need something i go to a b c d no it's all change at least that's my uh, i know it sounds wild but it's 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 all happening as i speak it, it does not actually um, and me being being a digital transformation or a strat consultant i have seen this happen earlier so so many times and again the time that you you and i used to work together we have seen this together i have seen it later so many times as well you know one of the refrains that i used to get so i'm teeing up a question for the customer i'm teeing up a question for ajay so i have seen it so many times that when we talk about automation everybody starts especially from business they start talking about okay so what is that cost going to be the product companies unfortunately come come back and say all right so so many bots so much amount of work etc etc and so that that means blah amount of cost so my conversation is it is that amount of cost for sure but there also is a cost in terms of when there is a break fix needed to happen what happens then ajay would you pick that up yeah yeah so uh, let me talk about uh, what srini was talking about the digital business and if you have certain digital businesses which is direct to the consumers then the question is all about the continuity or agility of the services which is uh, expected to be always available it the gone the days when we are talking about a 99% uptime and all these things over here think about any digital services which you are offering to your consumers they do not expect a single minutes downtime ever and if that's the crux of your business then the automation is paramount the automation and the availability of that particular applications is completely critical over here and if that's the case what are the things which you are doing to make sure that the point which can go back go bad and how quickly you are getting alerted how quickly you are taking certain level of troubleshooting how quickly your fault redundant solutions is taking over is all the critical aspects i'm not talking about devops and all these things over here i'm making it very layman is everything which needs to be up and running i'll probably give you a example of my previous organizations when i was working with sony prior to this organizations i had uh, managing a product called sony live which is a ott product and uh, sony live used to have uh, cricket as a one of the offering over there and we used to have 5 to 8 million of concurrency over there and it's a it's a if you look into a t20 matches which is a 3 hours durations and each and every minutes makes lot of sense with respect to the advertisement revenue and the subscriptions revenue and at that particular moment if we are talking about it can go bad for 10 minutes then you you know what kind of issue can it can bring so it is not all about cost it is all about your reputations your offering your monetization in the market using the digital product and that's the reason each and every layer of your product you need to be thinking about redundancy with respect to each and every layer all your building blocks how is it working is your all your apis are running if it is not running how quickly you are being alerted and that is the reason you may have lot of many many uh, products which needs to get integrated in your applications it may be your applications management if your api management your standard infrastructure how quickly uh, if we are running on aws instances how quickly it is scaling up how quickly you are hitting it off each and every instances etc etc is coming into the picture so it is again very extremely dependent on the type of the businesses you are but uh, probably i'll say that when the consumerization with respect to digital is happening more or less each and every businesses has not only the brick and mortar uh, point of sales they do have a digital point of sales and when we have a digital point of sales we can't expect any kind of downtime so 
automation is not a cost it is a opportunity to lose your revenue if it is not been there and if that's the mindset probably no cfo will be talking to you with respect to your total cost of ownership what is your payback period etc etc on your infrastructure that's my take and i strongly believe over there and i could maneuver that with all my cfo so far i completely agree with that and uh, just to add uh, one point on that you know more than in this kind of critical applications more than getting alerted post fact after the problem has happened now with the wealth of uh, information that we have from the monitoring data many customers in this kind of space are actually looking at what could be an impending problem is there a pattern that is developing which can result in a problem and how can how can i proactively prevent it from happening so that i will not even get into a problem to recover so that's where most of the things are moving on the operation so one comment as uh, what i want to make is that from a cost standpoint you know i think often times we when we calculate the cost it's never a linear equation we know that it's very quadratic and now it's becoming polynomial equation for two reasons one is you know you have deployment you have uh, procurement deployment ops and maintenance right operations and maintenance but there's one other part which i want to touch on is the management of end of life products that are making revenue that's also a cost you know cost of having technical debt continue <laughs> for a few more years till we you know perhaps catch hold of somebody like gauro to just transition them or have a new design and architecture because see from an architecture standpoint nobody here is saying that just disrupt everything and start a new thing we, nobody is saying that it's all about controlled migration of loads to a different environment right and that won't happen overnight because you are making revenue so i would think that technology debt management also is a cost the resources who are supporting that that cost should be taken into account when you are calculating pq i i don't know so yeah I, i will probably add up to it uh, so managing legacy the cost is not visible but once you started calculating probably there is a huge cost to it it is not only your application cost or something it is all about your data center cost the people cost the maintenance cost and the bigger thing is the cost of downtime many of the times which is if you are losing an opportunity to do something and if you have your point of sales and it is critical if it is brick and mortar point of sales also if it is ideal then think about number of people are sitting idle if think about a retailers if the application is not working at that particular moment so many people are idle if you start calculating the cost of all these idle people probably you will start aware that the cost is actually extremely high and that's the reason it is very wise that we should be looking into all these things and building up some ecosystem which is much appropriate in the current era so so that's that's something we must know and when we are calculating the tco we should be putting this as a tangible or intangible of upon the uh, organization's culture but that's something needs to be put over there i i like that and if i were to take off from there and mention that I, as i have gone and spoken with my clients now or in, in my past lives very often i have been asked so yeah yeah what, what you're talking about will make my systems my life my processes my business cheaper better faster but the question which comes comes back and i'm throwing this at gaurav the question which keeps coming back time and again it, it becomes very difficult to answer in some particular cases this esoteric term called value absolutely so how do you answer that so the, as a point that srikanth and ajay both made right it's the cost of opportunity that is lost and you cannot monetarily define that but when you're coming and talking about putting a number against that there are so many things that you have to talk about one is maintaining the monolith applications right and how do you justify its existence but on the counter you can't say that kill it overnight so from a technical view point what we do is we switch it off feature by feature talking in design patterns it means using the strangler pattern take a small slice of the functionality bring it to the newer world and when you are doing this you are doing it in a microservice way typically when you don't want single points of dependency large failures or cascading effects of one system failing 
Like if I take the case of Amazon, if you can't see the catalog, you still have product recommendation. If you can't see, uh, uh, if you can't do payouts at any point in time, systems will fail over a period of time. What you have to build in is the resilience of the entire application so that the business continues to a large extent. So that is something that you cannot put a dollar value against, right? So in such cases, how do you do it? What the role of automation here is extremely important. What you're talking about is a large set of microservices. Now you create for each microservice a set of people who take care of the infrastructure. It becomes monetarily impossible for that set of people to be uh, taking care of the large infrastructure that a microservices platform would require. So the inevitability of automation comes in play there. That is when your microservice team, your two pizza team is not only supposed to take care of uh, just writing code or taking care of the infrastructure. It is a single area of responsibility model where you are responsible from design, choice of tools, implementation, and post that supporting the code when it goes live as well. And that is how every developer is incentivized to write better code, which is highly resilient and build the automation. Because all of us who've been in the industry for a long time have been woken up at three o'clock and bulk of the times what we have done is restart the server. You don't want to do that. All you have to do is bring in the automation, here, build in the dashboards as Srinivas was saying, and ask those dashboards to respond to stimulus, respond to events. And that is how you get continuous business. And then the opportunity and the dollar value is always known to you by when the business says there was a downtime, they are able to give you a dollar value. So the uptime itself is a profit that you are making for your organization, the way I see it. So if I were to take this conversation up a little, little uh, allow me to go towards architecture, but not at a particular strata, and we can, we'll, we can come back to data at a point of time. But let me talk about enterprise architecture. Most of the clients that I have gone to in the last five, six years, and even earlier, the absence of an enterprise architecture of, of a company has been blatant and in my face most of the time. It's a different thing that mo most people unfortunately don't seem to understand what it is. But for even people who do, just the absence of it to me sounds very debilitating. And the reason I say this is because, you know, we are getting to a situation where we used to talk about, oh my God, the business is moving faster and technology has to keep up with that, with the number of changes. Now, it's starting to flip a little bit. Technology is starting to show obviously direction to business. Now, if that were to happen, how can my enterprise architecture not change fast enough for the technology to fold in? And similarly, then the business capabilities, which are part of your first le level of uh, enterprise architecture, how can that not start evolving together, right? So my conversation is about, it's not about business or technology leading one, one another, but it's about how does it sort of fit in? How does it fit in as like, like gears? Yeah, they want to take that? I think one aspect there is that, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm being cautious here. I don't want to kind of, I've got a, a principal architect here who's designed so many things. And, um, I think this whole, um, somehow, you know, the at least 20 years in the industry, I understand that the whole locus of enterprise architecture has been technology. I mean, if, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being impolite, but uh, give, given that the, the layer, the consumption layer is phenomenally changed. We are talking about and and again, it's it's been it's it's, it's a good thing that has come out of the wonderful technology of cloud computing, containerization, Docker. So there's so much they're signing a check on. So consumers have changed, consumption layer has changed. Anytime, any anywhere access, you can access it from a PDA, a mobile. It could be the instant analytics, right? So I think we should start making data flow or data as the locus of the architecture rather than making it technology as a locus of architecture where you say you are ERP, we also have ERP. You have a uh, enterprise CRM, we also have an enterprise CRM because we, most of them are disconnected. And then we start a big project connecting those dots and then offer it to customer. It doesn't make sense. So now we are talking about looking at the data flow from uh, from a standpoint of a life cycle of a data asset from start to finish and then build architecture around that. And so as if you understand, we talked about data ops a lot and data ops solution architecture is what 
is going to be the latest one that has to be referred to and not the erstwhile old model enterprise architecture which is more aligned to technology or technology stack for that matter. Okay, fair enough. So now talking about technology related, technology perhaps driven EA, one extremely key component now is data. The way you run your data, the way you integrate your data, the way you make applications talk to each other, but not just that, but you start planning your data architecture in a way that you can start doing almost a plug and play later, which means that your dev cycles now start becoming slightly different as well. Perhaps if we could have a conversation about how do I start isolating, how do I start doing containerization, how do I start doing data ops? Maybe Ajay and Gaurav could take that. Sure. So I'll talk about bit of uh, from the client side. Probably Gaurav can complement with respect to from a AWS point of view. So I'll talk about my current activities when we are looking into creating a ad tech uh, OTT platform, which is the likes of uh, you can say upgrade or something like that, and which is under construction at this moment. Uh, one of the major questions we always ask ourselves that what is that we need from a repurposing from a consumer's point of view what kind of data we'll be looking into it so the aspect of consumer data the aspects of uh, the content which is what kind of content that is courses will be like how we can integrate all these courses together so that it will be making sense and how we can recommend or personalized something which is there probably the easiest uh, example is netflix over here that if i am watching a content and my wife or my daughter is watching a different content we have a personas in the netflix over there we have a profile and so both the profile looks very different on the basis of what we are consuming in the past so that's the power of data which is creating the profile in such a way that it is more appropriate in my profile more appropriate to me and for my daughter's profile more appropriate to her so that's the that's the crux over here what data can do it and when we are looking for that particular things the biggest question when we are developing such platform is how we are capturing all this data how are we managing all this data so that it will make more sense with respect to a recommendations in the near future whenever we are try started using about it so the dev or the data operations which we are talking about the likes of cdp the, the consumer data platform and all these things how we are keeping it how we are tracking all the transactions how we are managing the journey with respect to a, a consumer who is coming to that particular platform needs to be known and needs to be put over there so that it will be useful it is not only useful for the personalizations or recommendation also it will be useful from a marketing standpoint of view so if i have a new courses which i am adding i need to be knowing which will be uh, for whom that particular course will be appropriate so coming back to the same example of netflix today we all receive a notification from netflix if a new content been added over there and this is not going to everybody it does not get broadcasted to everybody it always goes to the people who will be probably liking that particular content so how we can marry the offering what we have in our platform along with uh, maybe the consumers coming over there and that's always tricky that's always algo driven that's always something which requires a huge amount of data so that the data lake can be built the apis on the top of it can be built and it will be doing and coming back to our own platform so that the recommendations can be built so in short today's digital business does not have any existence if the data is not captured well not managed well not used well absolutely uh, yes. uh, what we say in amazon is that data has gravity and the examples that you are using uh, are largely driven because the quantum of data has increased. We are using machine learning. So what you are talking about in Netflix is machine learning models like factorization engines, which actually look at your persona, your previous watching history, and then give you recommendations based on that. Now, 
what happens is engineering for massive amounts of data which has grown exponentially over a period of time is extremely critical and extremely difficult as well our things have changed the cost of storage which we had in the previous years has gone drastically down the modus of storing data what we had previously was relational database now we've got so many more options of storing data and making sense out of it so what we generally recommend customers to do is that you don't just have to look at structured data which comes to you through forms and you know click of the buttons but you also look at the clickstream data the data that is not generally looked at by you your what the customer using as a browser is probably in your engineering server or apache http server marry that data and create a whole data lake this is an unopinionated probably contradictory set of data types and this is where a set of tools if you are into open source using uh, tools like apache nipper to consolidate data in a cheap uh, object store which is redundant will be the starting point the other factor and since it has to be automated because the quantum of data here is so large that no human can possibly look at we've gone beyond the time where we had structured data and just data warehouses now we talk about polyglot storage which means if the same data can actually be repeated across various types of systems where when you want to do a text based search you can use services like elastic search when you want to do analytics or machine learning you can use tools like that and you could use like platforms to do it at scale and the third part and which is where a set of tools like apache spark or flink have come into play so all of these need to be changed and automated the other part that is important to it is the event based program it is not batch mode programming you are not going to do things at the end of the day as a batch as and when the data is generated the, the currency of the data itself becomes important especially in financial domain like fraud analytics you can't have a person being in a shop say somewhere in andheri at one point in time and at the same time being in a physical store somewhere in croatia so fraud analytics real time pipeline that we have to be automated and that's what i've seen as a pattern especially in financial uh, industry in terms of data analysis uh, and using data to leverage their business and the whole part of it is driven through tools and automation so while you talk about that goram today we are talking about apis like never before we are talking about essentially data integration data ops and we are talking about the actual presence of an enterprise architecture while we talk about this at a microcosmic level we also are talking about applications being isolated in their own and for them not to taking a windows parlance not to have everything stuck around flowing around through the registry right? so which means that each of those applications starts becoming independent in some cases containerized in some cases serverless etc etc would you take that talk a little bit about dev and throw it back to shrikant No, I think let's sit and start on that. It's, it's a good point, Wayne, uh, uh, but I could go on and on for hours on that. So let <laughs> let, let us have the business perspective first, if I may, it's and right. then give you the tech angle. Sure. So, so on that, I think from a uh, so so, uh, Suhas, if you if you are pointing uh, in the direction where you talk about a solution architecture that is data driven, I think if you look at it, you know it, uh, the uh, the kind of tools that Gaurav has actually pointed out, are all in the cloud, you know, or they are all either coming from traditional off-the-shelf customer, off-the-shelf company, or somewhere in the open source, right? So whether you talk about uh, analytics platform, or whether you talk about big data analytics, or anything of that sort, or such such as you know, Triton, Elasticsearch, and all of that, and uh, this changing by the second, right? So I would think that I think one of the fundamentals of addressing a, this kind of new requirements is to have a data platform. Uh, conceptually, it's like you know you have a data workbench, which with, with layers of the application in the down uh, word trend of the uh, taxonomy, and then some kind of a governance structure around that, uh, because it's no more inside your enterprise, right? So uh, uh, managing such a large set of you know containerization environment docker environment at scale you know most importantly at scale is going to be a nightmare unless and until you have a a proper orchestration layer which contains the data workbench and then a consumption layer where anybody anywhere can access what is required by them 
most importantly what is required for them it's not like you're doing everything to everyone you know a sales guy typically if you look at an example like a, a sales force kind of a crm uh, if it if, if if you have got a particular role based access where you only need certain element of the application just give that we don't need to churn the ocean for making something uh, different for that particular uh, uh, user so in my view i think the future is all about persona based application access persona based compute persona based analytics dashboard and to uh, to our colleagues to point persona based uh, uh, churning of data that's the, that's how the future is looking like it's no more enterprise wide search enterprise wide data lake enterprise wide tool it's no more that way it is all subjective and fine tuned or configured to that particular kind of user and you are seeing that the consumer behavior is changing in that direction you know it it, it typical customer of netflix you're seeing that it's very persona based in the same way i think even in the enterprise side what is required for a solution architect is different from what is required by a typical developer or a uh, you know software analyst or a business analyst so that's changing as i speak the 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 uh, way in which architect architecture is being designed no absolutely srikant that's that's why i requested you to speak first and and the personas are extremely important so who's the consumer of your data if you're saying that at one point in time you want a data lake which is an unopinionated everything that you have you can't just dish it out to everyone a data scientist wants to look at everything and he does not want it structured he or she does not want it structured but you have batch reports which are canned and which need only a segment of the data and that for that there are various data store modalities that are available to you on the system side you've got oltp storage right you've got transactional databases which are either relational or no sql like mongodb or dynamodb then comes the data lake which is unopinionated and then you have got data marts which are individual stores which provide an extremely opinionated small uh, section view for the consumer and knowing the end structure of the data that needs to be consumed so a data scientist gets uh, his or her perspective and a developer gets that their own perspective so the data gets repeated potentially and all of that has to be changed with a uh, change with a set of tooling and the tooling depends on two factors first is the quantum of data and the second is the speed at which data needs to percolate from one end of the spectrum to the other and that would determine whether you go for spark like uh, uh, tools or then you go for apache hive or or another set of tools or do you want to really use recurrent neural networks to do machine learning on it that's that's typically dependent on the use of the data so in the product space who has the minimum viable product whatever we define right that is going to be relevant even in this world where you say i don't need everything give me what i need and that's changing fast changing the consumer behaviors are changing the ask is changing why are you giving so much data it's not making any relevance i don't monetize all of that you're showing me give me what i can monetize you know uh, don't don't churn the ocean for me and i keep saying that uh, um, and even if you look at healthcare uh, uh, canvas uh, so as what is relevant to healthcare provider may not be relevant to a patient even within patient their classification whether you are a, uh, a patient who's just looking for a consultation of this sort or whether you are actually uh, needing to have a hcp talk to you in person it all depends right and what is the kind of snapshot that you have on your computer or you on your pda is very relative customized designed for that particular instance and for the conversation it need not have everything that you talk about uh, uh, from a healthcare analytics platform standpoint right so i think that's fast changing i don't know to what extent every industry is, uh, uh, is seeing that but definitely netflix example is a brilliant example uh, and i think i will quote that uh, because consumer behaviors are changing whether you are a healthcare consumer or a retail consumer the behaviors are changing people don't want to have the same thing uh, continued uh, for for another decade or so so it's changing fast changing thank you we are slowly creeping up on the hour i'll try and put in a few more things that we want to talk about I wanted to have a quick chat about security shreva said we could have a quick chat about security we are seeing a lot of that completely everywhere whole bunch of companies we are seeing today losing their data to either ransomware people or uh, just just plain hackers or out of state actors and so on have you in your experience you know, worked with in the in the past what what's been your experience like like security 
should have been architected, should have been created, could have been, should have been implemented at the time of design, coding, and so on. Almost is starting to sound today like an afterthought. Unfortunately, but true. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It all starts with um, you know a typical org structure in a uh, enterprise. You will see that uh, the CIO and the CISO are uh, separate organizations. I think, in my opinion, it all starts there. <laughs> so um, when each of them are seeing uh, you know one another as adversary or a hindrance in my progress or you know a guy uh, engineering side is actually going to you know uh, put holes into the security policies that i have put in place uh, vice versa that's where this whole thing boils down um, so the way uh, these org structures have developed based on the legacy way of doing application development or production support for these applications or the infrastructure management that needs to change and i think that is where the devsecops definitely comes into picture as you rightly put unless the security by design and security by default those kind of approaches are embedded into the engineering life cycle itself the downstream security operations are going to be extremely difficult so if you just you know develop whatever uh, you know the functional part of it and then put it into an environment and then make that as a responsibility for of the security professionals to safeguard the applications and the data it's going to be short sighted so uh, in my experience customers who have put a huge value on the data the privacy and the security they have adopted DevSecOps and they started uh, in, uh, implementing security by design and security by default into their engineering uh, life cycle. And they have been much more successful in uh, safeguarding their assets and also being able to help the security professionals downstream having this structured methodology to monitor and they know what are the uh, areas where a failure is just not going to happen and what are the areas security lapses could be there but you have to live with that because there is some functionality that is requiring that uh, certain level of openness but you will make sure that your security monitoring and observations around those areas much more stronger so you can actually put your resources much more wisely into those areas where which needs to be monitored so that's what i have seen uh, in my experience thanks Guru, if, I, if i may the same question to you uh, if you would touch upon DevSecOps. Absolutely. So let me use the Amazon word. Uh, security is job zero. If you don't have your code cannot see production, your infrastructure cannot see production unless it has been hardened on the infrastructure side and code reviewed for security loophole. So your DevOps cycle itself should need uh, a code review. In fact, AWS even offers machine learning based code review cycle. There are third party open source reviews there. Infrastructure cannot be deployed into production environment unless it is hardened. The whole DevOps cycle should fail unless hardened and approved images go into place. It is a part of automation itself. If you're talking about immutable architectures, immutable architectures and security are uh, security built into the automation goes without saying. It's it's not it's never an afterthought. Thanks, Gaurav. Uh, if I might take that, use that as a cue to pass on our last set of roundtable and go with conversation or a question from Sudhirajan Satyapriyan. His question is around how to factor future price risk for infrastructure as a subscription model. And Ajay, if you would pick that up and also talk about the future a little bit, what do leaders need to do differently or better for automation to proliferate more than it has? And perhaps it's even a larger conversation in terms of how do you make digital transformation happen for CIOs of consumer companies like yours? And we could do that right. in a quick round table. Sure. So uh, future infrastructure cost is, uh, and when when uh, it is a subscription or a pay per use or typically in all language cloud services where we really do not know what is the cost. So definitely when you are getting into transition into a cloud centric environment from your standard server or a data center kind of environment, thus 
uncertainty always put you on the risk over there that what is your future cost definitely it is a big question and most of the time organization struggle in that particular thing that how to calculate the roi but then we need to define the purpose why we are doing it and when we are looking into why are we doing it and it is a business centric probably the answer is over there that how do we calculate the roi and if we do calculate the roi in a standard way that uh, i have a infrastructure i have a depreciation i need to depreciate in 3 years or 4 years and on that basis what is my per annum cost cloud does not make sense but if you are looking into cloud as a holistic approach to move towards future and see that what are the benefit you will be getting out of it with respect to your management cost with respect to your people centric cost etc it does make sense and subscriptions also make sense but you need to get into that particular journey for some time to realize and understand what kind of benefit you are getting but if you are starting probably it's always a question sure thank you ajay shrivas how do you see this from the cios that you interact and have interacted with cio cios both of us uh, future risk but in terms of what kind of type of leadership is required what do they need to do slightly better yeah i think what uh, my experience has been that you no know, if you just uh, the top leadership says that hey we need to you know work on automation and uh, as far as possible we need to be an automated uh, enterprise that alone is not going to be sufficient just uh, you know rhetoric and uh, exhortation of uh, we need to automate kind of thing that will work well so in my opinion an organization should have a clear vision on how they want to Uh, leverage the automation or the technologies that are enabling automation in enterprises we need to have the vision and a prescribed well defined well thought out goals should be put up put down and there should be a regular review mechanism around those goals in terms of how are we performing those uh, against those goals that needs to be the leadership focus that should be there in a rigorous way once that is in place the downstream organizational units will pick up the automation in their own uh, units in a more constructive way which can be put together towards meeting those goals that is when you will see that unnecessary focus and unnecessary distractions will not be there and you will actually put your automation dollars where your goals are actually going to be achieved so that structure is what i have seen it working Because you know, otherwise the technologies are proliferating, the tools are proliferating. You know, uh, somebody uh, uh, you know one fine morning gets a bright idea and starts automating that may not actually lead to any real outcome and it may not last longer. So unless you have structure and boundaries, guide rails around it, uh, it can just go out of hand. So, but once you have this goal set, uh, it can do wonders. Thanks, Rajivas. Shrikan, that sounds to me sort of like a very large organizational change management issue. but within a framework so for me i think um, uh, once you have because uh, like shrini pointed out you can have the best of the anecdotal mission statements for me i think once the mission statement is given um, even with a specific road map i think i strongly feel that we should look for small scale successes adopting stuff that is already available such as microservices do not churn the ocean because automation does not mean that you move away from a ambassador car into a mercedes benz the travel the journey is pretty long so look for small successes and slowly collate them into big successes and tell the story in in a way that it makes sense to business because at the end of the day it's all value right your value proposition is that i'll give you a minimum value product in 3 months from now you do scrum calls have all the agile devops teams together show small successes i'm damn sure the leadership would be happy uh, with whatever is being done because everybody is looking for progress they don't want you to just give some mission statements and leave it at that and trini's point is right you need to have the touch and feel almost on a daily basis to make sure that things work otherwise it becomes like a grand statements on a on a republic day <laughs> fair point but uh, if i might take, take that and uh... ask you how do you see this because amazon obviously has a platform and whatever the other tools which come with it what has been 
your set of recommendations or your group set of recommendations as you speak with the client where they subscribe onto AWS for whatever type of service and then they are going automation route, the automation being flowing from AWS as a platform. What's your set of recommendations there? And uh, Shikan very beautifully avoided one particular term, organizational change management. I would like you to pick, pick, that, up, pick that up because I, I really do believe that that's an issue because it, it gets, uh, gets a short strip. So let me take a first stab at it. In fact, what needed to be covered with data points has been covered by most senior folk here. The whole concept of experimentation is essential. That is where the theory, where the rubber hits the road, right? I have a utopian design, but it sees the light of the day when you build it. That's the whole concept of MVPs. What, what used to be thought processes and projects which are extended lifetime things, the things that used to get built over, uh, you know, years together. Uh, an MVP can actually be built over a weekend with, with sufficient number of pizzas and Pepsis, you know, for the younger developers. And that's the culture that you need to imbibe. And all of that has to be through the automation process. You grow big, but you grow big one step at a time and not take a big bang approach. And when you have a large number of such projects, each of them run independently of each other and shake hands with each other through the APIs that you've exposed and not go into the database. And that's how the organizations of tomorrow will exist. Having automated all of their infrastructure and going from uh, actually taking in account the whole factor in, in the cost of the whole thing. You have to take stances like what is the cost of choosing an operating system? What's the benefit of choosing a particular operating system? Is that adding a direct value to my business? Is that something that where I have to do a lot of heavy lifting? What matters to my customer at the end of the day is a piece of code that I have written, right? So what is it that I'll get my team to focus on? It would essentially be the business benefits and the code that my team writes. And which is where the whole uh, concept of function as a service or code as a service comes. And that's the way you would want to play in, in the serverless domain. It, it essentially means that you pay only for the infrastructure when your code is executing. And you pay only when somebody is executing that code. Somebody uh, pushes in a button. That automation uh, and that journey is the journey for future. And that actually helps you even amortize your cost, get visibility into it and handle scale at an infinite level. And that's possibly what the future looks like as well. Thank you very much. Shrikant, that was a deliberate jab. And uh, people <laughs> who are attending, just let, let you know, Shrikant and I go, go back a while, right? So I, I can afford to take, take those jabs as with some of the other, other people. We have actually come to, um, come to the top of the hour, more than that, actually. would like to thank the guest speakers in lovely hosting you, lovely chatting with you. We are uh, coming to a close for this session. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Been a pleasure. The pleasure was all, all of you there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, everybody.